because if you control this area properly, scanning is very fast, it's very accurate. Really, this is what makes scanning so good if you do it correctly, because if you control this area properly, scanning is very fast, it's very accurate. You know, you just can't think of taking an impression ever again in your practice. The issue I find is when clinicians do not control the scan area properly, they have constant issues with their scanners, they have inaccurate scans, poor fitting restorations, and this is where the frustration creeps in. Guys, I do a lot of crown preparations, much like many of you out there. Every day I'm, I'm minimum prepping one or two crowns. Every single crown preparation I'm placing retraction cord, every single one. Now I know there are some, uh, you know, few instances where the preparation margins circumferentially are super gingival, but these are very rare. I know these days we don't place our margin at the gum line, but even when you break the contact and oftentimes there's a deep filling or some decay, most of the time in the interproximal areas, your margin line is equi or subgingival. That's just the way it is. And if you try to scan that without any soft tissue control, you're going to run into issues. Okay, because the, the soft tissue is going to blend with your margin line and this is where you're going to have inaccuracies. So in my opinion, soft tissue control is probably the number one thing to really master. And what I mean by that is good retraction of the gingival tissue around your preparation. And there's many different ways of doing this, retraction cord, retraction paste, gingival troughing. I'll be honest, guys, I don't get too fancy. I just use retraction cord. 99% of my cases is just retraction cord. And I'll use quite a large retraction cord. I reflect in my career, when I first started placing retraction cord, I wasn't too confident. So I would use the smallest cord available because that was easy to pack. But the thing is, that doesn't really displace the tissue much. So these days, oftentimes, I'm going straight to a number two or a number one, especially for molars. Posterior teeth, you know, the, the gingival sulcus is quite large. And with the topic of placing retraction cord, what I would do is I will, for instance, in this case, place one retraction cord and then check with a mirror. If all the soft tissue is displaced successfully from the tooth, then I will proceed to scan. If some of the soft tissue is still, you know, flopped over the margin, I don't start scanning. What I do is place another attraction cord of equal size or smaller size. It really doesn't matter. Okay, I will place another retraction cord and I will cut that retraction cord in half. So I need to place it in the areas where the, the tissue is flopped over my preparation. And then I'll check again and then I'll place another retraction cord if I have to. Now, it's very rare for me to have to place more than one to two retraction cords. But in some instances where it's just very flappy tissue, I will. And, and I'll keep a placing retraction cord until the soft tissue is no longer overlapping on my tooth preparation because if it is we're going to have an issue with the scan the scanner cannot scan around gums it's not like impression material where we used to have it in a syringe and squirt it uh, past the you know the the gingiva and past the tooth preparation it's not like that a scanner is just a camera and it will just pick up what you can see the other benefit about retraction cord and i'll get on to this in a few slides, is it also helps you control bleeding and curricular fluid. So I routinely place retraction cord like this. The other thing about soft tissue management, and I see many clinicians making this mistake, is it also includes the cheeks and the tongue. So if you're scanning on the mandible, you need to control the tongue. And if you're scanning on the maxilla, you need to control the cheeks. Okay, so mandible, cheeks, cheeks and tongue, Maxilla cheeks. And what I mean by that is this picture is of me and my DA, um, Blanche, she's a, an amazing DA, uh, working together. And what you can see is that I'm scanning and what's she doing here? So she is retracting. And this is one thing that I don't understand why dentists don't train their DAs to be more familiar with the whole scanning process so that they can retract with you and they follow your scan and help retract the soft tissues. And you can see with my hand, I'm also retracting. So I'm retracting the one side, she's retracting the other side, and it just makes scanning so easy. 
The reason why scanning a model of teeth is so easy, guys, is there's no cheeks to battle with. If you displace the tissues very well and retract the cheeks, scanning is incredibly fast and easy. But the issue is I find too many clinicians trying to scan with no um, soft tissue retraction at all. And that brings us up to another point about what's your dental assistant's role in all of this. And so for a starter, you can train your dental assistant to set up the scanner, switch it on, get them familiar with the software, adding case details, calibration and maintenance. During scanning, it's vital to get them on board with, you know, if there's a, if they have a triplex on their side or an air syringe, they can, they can uh, dry the area. They can also help retract the cheeks, retract the tongue. Suction when necessary is critical because if there's a lot of soft, uh, if there's a lot of fluid, that's going to be an issue. And we'll talk about that in a second. And also cleaning the scanner. And realistically, you should also train your DA to be able to scan uh, independently because this opens up a, a number of different workflows for you, even for basic things like just a sports mouth guard or something like that. So I spoke about it prior and, and I'll repeat it. First, you need to control the soft tissue. The other key way clinically to master your scans is to control the liquids. And the liquids are basically blood, saliva, and cravicular fluid. Now, saliva is straightforward. You need to have suction in there. Some people salivate a lot, some people don't. In the mandible, you have to control saliva a lot more. You all know this. So make sure you have someone, either you suctioning or your DA. But you need to make sure you, you suction the area. And more importantly, especially around key sites like a crown preparation, you need to make sure you use your, your triple X and and air dry this area very well, okay? Because a scanner is a camera, it's gonna shoot light, and if there's any water droplets or anything like that in the area, that's gonna cause an issue with the scan. So in areas that are very critical, like crown preparations, like implant scan bodies, they need to be dry. If you're just scanning for something like a sports mouth guard, it usually you don't have to dry every single tooth, but it does depend patient on patient. We all know some patients come in and they have this thick, frothy saliva everywhere. Obviously, you need to dry that. Others, they don't really have much saliva, even just walking around. And in those cases, you can just scan that immediately. But regardless, if it's a crown preparation, you have to dry it very thoroughly. Look how dry this looks. And this is going to make the scan very easy. I mentioned it before, you need to control bleeding and cravicular fluid. And one of the ways I do that is just by retraction cord, soaked in hemostatic agent, and it helps a lot. And you can scan the deepest of tooth preparations. This idea that you can't scan deep preparations is basically founded on nothing. The only reason we can't, people say we can't scan deep tooth preparations is because it's they find it very difficult to control the gingiva because the deeper you get, the larger the kind of this big piece of gingiva that's covering the prep. And you have to deal with bleeding a lot more. Now, for me, if I have a deep preparation, I will control the gingiva by either lasering it or cutting it away with a thermocut burn. And not aggressively, just the parts that are overlapping my prep. Then it comes to controlling bleeding and cravicular fluid. I place retraction cord. I don't care how deep the margin is, I always place retraction cord. And one trick with the placing retraction cord that I like to do is I pack around the contacts first, and I will pack one end of the retraction cord over here, and then I will go all the way around and pack the deepest end last, so the rest of the cord is secure. Because sometimes packing on the deep end can be frustrating because you press it, and it moves. You press it and it moves. But if the rest of the cord is secure, it makes that a lot easier. The other thing, once I pack my cord, if there's still bleeding, I will pack a hemostatic pellet there and leave it for five minutes or so. And then check. If it's still bleeding, I will use hemostatic agent. And then if it's still bleeding, I will use a laser to cauterize. Now, I very seldom need to use a laser, guys. So don't feel like you have to use a laser every prep. I, 90% of my cases, just use a retraction cord and hemostatic pellets when needed. 19, maybe 95% of my cases. So really, that's the key. Just control the bleeding, 
cravicular fluid and saliva. And then you get to a point where you're something like this, where you have your preparations, everything is well controlled, you can clearly see the margins. If you look in a mirror or you take a DSLR photo and you can clearly see the margins like this, the scanner is going to have no problem at all scanning this. When I do go to scan, I'll dry this a bit better because you can see there's some saliva or cravicular fluid here. So dry this and you can see the retraction. Okay, always retract the soft tissues. I'm retracting on one side, DA is retracting on the other side. And then you can scan very simply. I don't need to go over scan strategies because I know a lot of you are tired of hearing them. Everyone talks about them. So scan it as you would and then you get a very clear scan and that can go to your lab. And, and they will be much happier if you use retraction cord because it makes their job a lot easier. So how do you know your scan didn't go well? It's very simple. You have to look at your scan because if you have any of these issues, you need to delete the scan and rescan it. Or you can erase just this area and rescan it. I personally look, this is just a bit of personal preference. Scanners are so fast these days. If it's just a quadrant scan, I'll delete the whole thing. Because there's also been literature, literature to show that if you delete and then rescan and then delete and then rescan and you keep doing this, it actually involves inaccuracies. So if you're finding yourself doing this more than two to three times, I would suggest you delete the whole scan, control the area properly, and then rescan. And what this artifact is showing you here is if you ever see a bubble like this, Basically, this is either some form of liquid, either blood or saliva. So any bubbles like that, and they commonly occur in, in molars as well on the occlusal, but oftentimes they don't matter if you're just doing a sports guard. But if you see a bubble like this around your margin, and obviously the patient doesn't have like a bubble like this or a concavity, so this is an issue. And this is where you would need to control that area. And you can already see the bleeding anyway and then rescan. Here's another example where the tissue may be slightly overlapping the area. Now, you, with the software itself, you may get away with this and you may be able to cut this out, but you want to check these areas. So what I recommend is after you take a scan, you check the area very thoroughly, check the margins. That's really the key. Check the margins all the way around and make sure you don't have any missing data. So getting the perfect scan I just want to take a bit of a sidestep and talk about scan sprays. Now, scan sprays are something that's not going to be very um, familiar for a lot of people, especially if they're new to scanning, because it's not really a market norm anymore. Uh, six, seven years ago, guys, scan sprays were basically almost mandatory. And even before that, about eight, nine years ago, in the, some of the first or second or third generation scanners, they were mandatory. What a scan spray is, it's basically, it comes in a can, a lot of different companies sell it, and you can spray and it creates this kind of contrast medium on the area. Now, I mention it, just so you know, I haven't needed to use a scan spray in about six years, seven years maybe, you know, it's just not something that's common or, in, or needed really with modern scanners, as long as you dry the area well. But I do know some clinicians like to use it for very deep preparations, it does help somewhat. And some clinicians also like to use it for shiny restorations. Again, just on the topic of shiny restorations, because I know this comes up so much, how do I scan metal? I've never had an issue with scanning a metal restoration with any scanner out there. And really what you need to think about is once again, a scanner as a camera, it is shooting light and that light reflects and it is captured by a sensor. The reason why some metals are hard to scan is because you're basically getting a lot of reflection of that light and it just it blinds the sensor, it can't see what it's doing. So how I get around this when I'm scanning metals and I've scanned RPDs, I've scanned full gold crowns, I've scanned the you know really shiny amalgam fillings from Japan. Um, now, how I get around this is essentially you just angle the scanner in a different way so that light is not all reflecting back into the sensor. So it's just about angling and, and using your, your wrist motion around that metal. But if you need to, you can use scan sprays and obviously software, which we will get into later, 
has scan modes in there to help make this easier.